All right. Thank you for joining me, me today. Welcome to the Tell It Like It Is podcast. This is Alexi Bailey, and I have Keyshawn with us. How are you yeah. today, Keyshawn? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm feeling great. Glad to have you with us. Keyshawn, I'm so impressed by what I've seen you doing on Instagram. Thank you. Um, I came across your page, I think I saw, I think it was one of your reels, and between the reels and the title of the account, Your Future Brown Therapist, mm -hmm. I just got intrigued, I started looking at your content, and it was really breathtaking. I was really impressed that as a student, you're like doing this amazing work. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what led to you getting, starting the account? <clears throat> yeah, so I just had a passion for mental health since I was in ninth grade. I'm not sure where it came from, but I was just very intrigued by it. Um, it must have been something I saw on TV, I'm not sure. And um, in college, I uh, minored in psychology. I was a human services major. And uh, when I graduated college, I was a case manager working with the mentally ill population, but I, I knew I didn't want to be a case manager forever, but I wasn't sure what route I wanted to take. And I've heard my friends always tell me like, oh, you need to be a therapist. You're a good listener. You get advice here to see that. I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's for me. But eventually I'm after doing more research and realizing, you know, I'm ready to start grad school. I felt like therapy would be the right route for me. I could still work with that population. And then I thought, wow, maybe I could document my journey while I'm in grad school and what I'm learning, share it with other people, share it with the minority community specifically because of so many stigmas and just misinformation. And I just literally in the middle of the night, I was like, your future brown therapist. And I wrote it in my notes. So I didn't forget it. And then I woke up and I just made the Instagram account. I didn't have any content or ideas. I just knew I wanted to get the name out there before someone else did. And I launched it on my birthday last year. And yeah, that's how your future round therapist got started. <clears throat> Very good. Um, how far along are you in grad school? So I started last August. So I'm about nine months in. Um, I start my internship soon in the next few months. So. I'm about halfway done. Where do you live? What what school is this? Um, so it's an online school. It's based in California. It's called Turo University Worldwide, but I currently live in Baltimore. Okay, awesome. Um, you said you studied uh, human services. Mm -hmm. What year did you graduate? Um, 2016. Okay, then you started working right away and with mental health. Mm -hmm, yes, um, I worked at a nonprofit, a large nonprofit organization, and I was a case manager in Baltimore City. Working, uh, my clients were all severely mentally ill: schizophrenia, bipolar, major depressive disorder, OCD. I mean, anxiety, everything you can think of as far as like severe mental illnesses they had, and so. Um, I work with them, you know, helping them get doctor's appointments and just trying to keep them out of the hospital and acclimated to, uh, who's, you know, society. Who is your program funded by? Um, it was, it's funded by Shepherd Pratt Hospital. I'm not sure if you ever heard of them. They're like a, a very large um, psychiatric hospital uh, in the country. They're like one of the best in the country. And I interned there actually in college. So they have like a bunch of companies umbrellaed under their hospital. Now, you know, I'm not a social work or mental health expert. Um, like I said to you before, I did do some <clears throat> work um, in social services in New York City. And mm -hmm. I don't have to ask you, it was hard. It was very hard. It was very, very hard. Um, emotionally, more than anything, it was very hard because they would tell us like, you know, don't get emotionally involved, but it was impossible because as a case manager, I literally helped them find a place to live, helped them with their food, helped them with their, you know, uh, medication. We had, we had to work on weekends. We were involved with their family, like literally every aspect of their life. 
they depended on us. I felt like they were my children. I'd always say, you know, they're my kids because even though they were adults and older than me, they depended on me very heavily. So it was like, how can I not emotionally get involved with these people when, you know, we're so close? In my experience, the, the biggest hurdle was that it was difficult to connect them to resources. Mm -hmm. Um, a because they had their own issues which prevented which was the barrier and b there was a lack of resources mm -hmm. so at my job we we had a lot of connections to resources um because of the fact that we were funded by the psychiatric hospital so the resources part was was you know we had a lot of access to that but it was because of their mental illnesses and how you know severe it was it was really hard to get them to you know just go along with the plan and you know even though the plan could be like a straight line you know they definitely made it harder to get to these goals so we we just had a lot of issues and a lot of family issues as well like a lot of them didn't have that support so we were their family <clears throat> So how has the last nine months been for you in, in grad school? Um, it's getting easier. It was very hard at first because my son, I have a son, he'll be two in August. So he stayed at home with me full time. And so I had to get work done while he was napping or early in the morning or late at night, and just like find time to uh, you know, get my work done. Um, but now he's in daycare three days out of the week. So oh, it makes God. life, yeah, it makes life so much easier those three days. It's like, phew, so I get a chance to, you know, actually sit down and, and take my time and, and kind of dive in more than I would when I felt like I was rushing with him. So it's been a journey, but it is it's getting easier. It's getting easier. And the content, what, what are you absorbing? What are you getting? Um, whew, I'm getting a lot. So right now I just started. So we were off last week for like a spring break. And now I am taking assessments and tests. So I guess learning how to assess different disorders and things like that. And I'm also taking uh, group counseling. So learning how to facilitate group therapy sessions and um, I've taken classes on child-focused therapy, couples therapy, psychopathology, um, research mythology. I know I'm missing some some classes. Okay. But I, now, I saw that you said that you wanted to be a marriage and counseling relationship therapist. Yes, yeah, so I'm in marriage and family therapy. Um, so I am interested in couples therapy as well after taking you know, a class on that and learning more about it. I'm definitely interested in, um, you know, helping couples out because couples therapists kind of get a bad name. Yeah. And I learned in school that most like, so I'm in marriage and family therapy, so we're required to take couples classes, but in, in other therapy and counseling programs, they don't take any couples classes. So there's a lot of therapists who will come out and never took any classes about couples or interned with couples and they'll take on couples clients and not know how to handle it. And, you know, nothing gets solved. So a lot of couples, you know, are like, you know, couples therapy is not real, it doesn't work, but it's because they didn't see like a married and family therapist, someone who's actually trained to work with couples. Um, so it kind of gets a bad name. So I definitely want to, use the skills that I'm learning to help couples. So you've decided that that's what you wanted to focus on? Um, well, I would, I wanna focus on psychoeducation, um, but I want to help couples and families who like have a family member who has a mental illness. And I wanna help teach them how to cope with that, how to, you know, learn boundaries, but how to be supportive to their family member who's suffering. So. If you have a spouse who has a mental illness and you're, you know, trying to work with that or a parent or a sibling or someone close to you, you know, just teaching them how to educating them on the illness and, and how to be a support, but yet still, you know, remain sane themselves. <clears throat> Got it. I'm very excited about the fact that you are the brown therapists, uh -huh. you know, African-Americans, 
you know, we need all the support we can get. Definitely. And it's a very complicated dynamic. And I feel like you've already like addressed so much of it. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, um, in our community is, you know, it's very unfortunate that mental health is not really talked about. It's, you know, kind of shunned. Like I just made a reel where I was saying, you know, therapy is not just for white people, you know, black people, we need to heal as well. And I got some comments from um, people who are not minority saying, well, no one ever said therapy is just for white people. And this is not true. And I had to explain to them, like, coming from my perspective growing up, I heard all of the time, like, oh, white people, we don't do therapy. That's a white people thing. That's a rich people thing. You know, just these, these things that are not true. And that was the point of my reel to explain that, you know, it's not just for a certain population. Everyone can benefit from therapy. And so, you know, when I explained it to some of those people, they were like, oh, I never knew that. I didn't know that. And I'm like, you know, that's okay. That's why I'm here to, you know, educate. And, um, I just want to definitely break that that stigma that we have going on. And I feel like a lot of progress is being made. There's a lot of pages out there I see now where people are educating, you know, our community and our people and, and just breaking down these, these barriers that we have been taught all our lives. Um, now, do you think there's merit to the hesitation that people of color have with therapy? Yes, yes. So I, I do understand as well why people um, have hesitation because of the history of being abused in, in, uh, in medical spaces. And even now, um, uh, Black people are <clears throat> diagnosed more harshly than white people. Um, they are not um, referred to therapy or referred to a psychiatrist for medication as much as white people. So there's definitely still some disparities and I can understand why there's distrust and hesitancy. Um, but we still, you know, that's why I encourage, you know, we'll seek a black therapist if you don't feel comfortable with a white person, you know, there are black therapists out there, minority therapists, maybe, you know, you'll feel more comfortable with someone who looks like you and you feel understands you and can relate to you and you don't have to feel like you have to be this robot or, you know, have this tension. You know, I do have my experiences in school and my experiences as a practitioner. And, you know, I also have my experiences from being black. And I've mm -hmm. also been to therapists in the past. And it's a very dangerous sword. It really mm -hmm. is to walk into a room with a human being who's on the same level as you, mm -hmm. you know, as a human being. and to think that they're gonna help you with your problems. Um, I look at it more as, it's like a coaching, you know, like mm -hmm. I tell you what I wanna work on and, you know, it keeps, it, it gives a certain level of accountability. Mm -hmm. And therapists, hopefully they'll have strategies, point out things. Um, and I've also seen that um, as in therapy that, um, you can't tell people what to do, right? So mm -hmm. if they're supposed to be, you know, doing the right thing, you can't tell them, well, this is the right thing. This is what you should do. Go do it this week. Right. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to go around in a circle with them and guide them through their own thinking and, mm -hmm. you know, and that's not easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good therapist is not there like most people think oh therapists just give you advice and tell you what to do but that's the opposite of what we're supposed to do we're supposed to help guide you make your own decision you know it would be very unethical for me to tell you what to do especially with major life decisions because you know it is your life so if you leave my office and you make a decision based on what I said it could be you know very detrimental to you so Therapists are not there to tell you what to do. We're there to help you realize things you may not have realized, help you process things, help you understand things. And like you said, kind of coach you through and, and you are the leader. You tell me what you come to therapy for and what you need and what you hope to get out of it. And we can make a plan to get to what you want. It's not about what I want and what I think is right for your life. Now, I, 
I have to tell you, like, you know, I'm sure people are going to go back and look at your page after this. And the way you've organized your content and strategized in those messages, I think you're going to do really well and go really far. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. The mental health Mondays, you know, all of the little things. I'm just like, it's, it's very good to, for someone who's in school doing it by themselves, juggling, being a parent, um, and newlywed, right? Yeah, I've been married four years now, so. Still new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> how, do you, how do you manage all of that? Um, it's definitely taken a while to try to juggle. I feel like I'm kind of just starting to finally get healthy or balance. Like I said, when my son was home, it was really, really hard trying to keep him entertained, especially when he became a toddler and he could walk and run around. And then my husband works from home. So trying to work around him and it was definitely hard, but now I actually, you know, know the three days he's in school and I can make a schedule and like actually block out hour by hour what I need to get done. And I'm learning that, you know, if it doesn't all get done, then it's okay. Just try again the next day and just not being so hard on myself, just doing what I can. And if everyone's alive and happy at the end of the day, that's all that matters. That's what I've been, you know, teaching myself. Now you've been, you said you've always been the type of person where people come to and talk to you about problems. How mm -hmm. has that shifted since you've been in school? Um, it really hasn't shifted. I think people now, my friends and family, they're like, oh, I can't wait. You can be my therapist. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. It's just very unethical. And trust me, you don't want me to know so much about you and all your issues and then also be your friend like that's just too many boundaries crossed cross. so um I'm learning to give you know have more boundaries with my friends and the people around me who like to you know use me for life and um just letting them know that I love you and I'm here to support you but I can't you know give you all the answers I have my own stuff that I'm going through as well and if I take on everybody else's stuff you know I'm I'm going to be no good to myself or you so just definitely setting some boundaries uh so people call you and they session. start telling you stuff and you're like slow down and like <laughs> yeah i kind of i don't necessarily say slow down but i feel like i'm not gonna say i don't ask as much like i used to be very invested like if someone would tell me you know okay i have this going on then i would call you know the next day or in a couple days just to check in and want, you know ask more but now it's kind of like okay if you come to me with something I'll tell you you know what I mean uh you know what I feel and then I'll just you know let you handle the rest I'm not going to be as involved and in calling and checking in and all sort of stuff you know just setting that boundary that's important that's really important mm -hmm. um has has it affected your relationship with your significant other um <laughs> no not in a negative way but if I say certain things he will be like don't try to you know don't come in here with all that therapy stuff don't try to counsel me I don't need that and I'm like I'm not trying to but it's kind of hard especially when I was in the couples class like I learned so much about my own relationships and the ones around me like my friends and stuff I was just like mind blown and I just I did not necessarily wanted to use it but it kind of was impossible for me not to you know be aware of the things that I was seeing after I had learned about it so it is very interesting I try not to you know bring it into my own house but sometimes I can't help it can you give us an example <laughs> okay so we learned about attachment styles and how um you know what you experience as a kid as a baby mm -hmm. can and your attachment to your parents how that affects your relationships later on in life so if you had a secure attachment with your parents and you felt loved and safe with your parents as an infant it's a, a bigger chance of you feeling you know safe and having a healthy relationship with a significant other in the future but if you had like um, 
experiences where your parent was, you know, kind of in and out of your life as a baby, you didn't feel secure with them, then growing up, you'll have a hard time feeling secure in a relationship and it can cause issues because you don't want to get too attached to them. And, you know, you feel like, well, this person's going to be in and out of my life. And I definitely saw that in my own life and relationship where I didn't have as secure of an attachment with a parent and it affected me in my own personal relationship. And I'm like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. Like I can understand why I used to be like that. It's because growing up, I had this, you know, issue with my own parents. So it affected my relationship. And I kind of saw it with some of my friends as well. So going back to your childhood, your parents weren't together. Were you raised by your mom, dad, or? So I was raised by my mother and grandmother. Um, my father was in the military, so he moved like all the time, like every three years he was in a completely different state and he would come and visit, you know, whenever he had a break, but mainly my mom and my grandma um, raised me. Okay. All right. So where do you think that influence came from for you to be, um, therapeutically minded I have no idea that's a I am not sure I just feel like ever since I can remember I've always been like mature for my age I've always been told that and I guess being you know heavily influenced by my grandma as well you know I she lived I lived with her until you know she passed away right when I graduated college so she was very old school southern woman and I feel like a lot of her values and just, she just taught me so much. So I kind of became an old soul, you know, growing up. And I just, I think she really influenced that part of me. Can you tell us um, something she told you? <sighs> oh, she told me so much. She taught me so much. Um, she taught me a lot about friendships. She really didn't trust anybody. <laughs> She would always say, you know, you don't have friends. You have people you laugh and talk with. I said, y'all just laugh and talk. And I'm like, grandma, that's not true. But it really kind of did. Later on in life, I saw like, you know, there were a lot of situations where I thought, you know, someone was my friend and they weren't really my friend. And I think that she was really good with that intuition, seeing like who's, you know, really there for you and don't just trust everybody and call everyone your friend because you know, as you get older, you realize that that title can be thrown around very loosely. So she really taught me to, you know, keep my eyes on everyone and be aware and just not be too open. And when you're two years old and you go to daycare and you meet someone for the first time, this is your best friend. You know, you guys share the juice box together and this is my mm -hmm. friend. And you go to elementary school, you see each my friend and you play outside, you know, I think that's normal for kids to just, everybody's your friend, right? Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that I love about kids is that everybody's your, you get that, you connect easily with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but as you get older and older, you know, people become more selfish and, you know, they drift off and they're, they're still your, they still, when they're with you, they're your friend, but they have mm -hmm. so much more going on. Yeah. Anything, any other major, cause that's a good one. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. I find that the people who raise us and the things they were trying to teach us, they really have this uh, um, tra transcend transcendental uh, meaning. And at the time you're like, okay, you know, this is my friend, you know, and later on, like you're gonna carry that with you. And you mm -hmm. find yourself telling your kids about it. And it's like, mm -hmm. like, it takes you 20 years for it to really like make sense. Yeah. And in yeah, a way you definitely. almost like, you're like, why was she trying to teach me that at that young age? Cause you really <laughs> weren't ready for it. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think about like where my kids are and the stuff I'm trying to teach them, like I'm teaching them stuff that I'm still like, absorbing myself mm -hmm. so when you yeah. say when I'm saying that to them I I really don't expect them to to grasp it the way mm -hmm. that I do and mm -hmm. and use it the way I do but you have to say it to them yeah 
Yeah, I think as parents, it's, you know, one of our main jobs to, you know, our kids are supposed to be better than us. And my mom would always tell me that, like, I want you to be better than me. I want you to be better than me. And, you know, normally she would tell me that when I was being chastised or she was lecturing me and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now having my own son, I understand it's like, you really do want your kid to be you 2.0, like the better version of you and the things that I didn't know growing up or I didn't understand I want him to know and understand so he doesn't make the same mistakes and so that he can just be you know a better version of me so I definitely understand that now as a parent so Keyshawn I have I have um you know a very big heart and I think I got that from my mom and mm -hmm. my mom was a single mom and I'm an only child do you have siblings yes who do you have I have two sisters and two brothers. I'm literally right in the middle. So two younger siblings, two older siblings. Are they into uh, mental health and, and um, services? No, I'm the only one. So are you like the, the, the peacekeeper of the family, keeping <laughs> it all together? And I try. So my family, um, as far as my siblings, so I have my youngest brother, Kevin, he is, so we both have the same mom and dad. And then the rest of my siblings, my other three siblings, we have the same dad and different mom. So I only grew up in the house with my youngest brother, but my oldest sister and my older brother, we all lived in the same area. So even though we didn't have the same mom, we would still, you know, see each other at our grandma's house and we still kept a relationship. And then my younger sister, she was born in Kansas when my dad was stationed in Kansas. So I've never seen her in person before. I see her on social media and text her and stuff, but I've never met her in person. So, you know, my sibling dynamic is, is kind of all over the place, but I, I do think out of all of us, um, I'm definitely like that peacekeeper out of all, all of the, the four of us who have like a closer relationship. Uh, I am, yeah. So your grandmother that you mentioned was your father's mom? It was my mom's mom. Got it. Got mm -hmm. it. How, what's your little brother studying? What does he want to do? So he's just graduating high school coming up in May. And he's an artist. He's an amazing artist, a drawing. So he wants to do something with like animation or cartoonist. Um, things like that. So he's probably going to be going to like a community college to, you know, get started and figure out exactly what he wants to do. But I know it has to do with art. That's awesome. I encourage mm -hmm. him to stay independent and not get sucked into like a job. And, mm -hmm. You know, yeah, so I, I was saying that um, my mom gave me a lot of that compassion I just got a pop up. Um, my my mom gave me a lot of that compassion for others, you know, that ability to listen and to dive deep and care. And you know, it, it, when I came through the door, she was always like, "Oh, how was your day?" And and she would kind of listen to me. And you know, I think I would be introspective in general, but I think she really honed that by example. So I think along the way, I really just started absorbing that and reflecting that out. And, you know, it's molded who I am. Mm -hmm. Now, as a person of color, as a person of color, we have a very unique experience in America. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so much going on. And I, and I you know, I think therapy is a very important piece to this. Mm -hmm. Are you what would you want to say therapeutically to people of color in America? Wow, um, that's a big question. Um, I would want to say, um, you know, therapeutically, just it's, it's it can be very frustrating being you know, a minority in America. I completely understand that I went to a PWI. So 
So I have a lot of experiences where, you know, it could make me very bitter or make me very judgmental to, uh, you know, a certain race, the, the majority race. But I really feel like we can't allow that that feeling of hatred and, and that feeling of, of defeat and then all the negative emotions we can feel and have the right to feel in a lot of situations consume us. We really have to just continue rising above. And I think that's what we've been doing for all these years is like, you know, I think a lot of people thought we wouldn't be where we are today, that there was never going to be a Black president, a Black woman, vice president. We're just putting ourselves in spaces that I think a lot of people would have never imagined us. And we just have to keep doing that, keep being doctors, lawyers, therapists, teachers, you know, all these great things and, and heal ourselves. Let's not focus so much on, you know, the negativity. Let's focus on trying to move forward and heal and, and making the next generation better and just, you know, providing resources to the next generation so we can just continue to rise and rise and rise until there is equality and until we're respected in all spaces. And it's going to take a lot of work and um, a lot of, you know, just being the bigger person. But I think at the end of the day, it's going to be worth it. And um, that's just how we're going to continue to, to grow uh, as, a, as, a, as a minority. There's a lot of grief. There's a lot of loss. You know, we, we've been through a lot of brokenness mm -hmm. and we definitely need therapeutic voices. Mm -hmm. We definitely need that kind of work. It's very, mm -hmm. very important. The most essential thing. Um, our resiliency is one of our biggest strengths. Yeah. And we continue to, you know, like a, a rose in the concrete and that's that's one of those things that you know i think no one can discredit oh yeah mm -hmm. exactly how close are you to where you grew up now so i was born in washington dc and raised like out right outside of dc in maryland and pg county area and then i went to college in baltimore and after graduating i just stayed up here because i found a job so I'm not too far from where I grew up, like 45 minutes an hour away. Now, what was the community like for you growing up? That's a very good question. So <laughs> I grew up in a place called Suitland, Maryland, which is predominantly black. It's a little bit hood. Um, I promise you, I didn't see any white people in person. I thought I only, I thought they were only on TV. I think I saw like one Hispanic person, no age, like I didn't see that in my community. But when I turned 10 years old, we moved to a different part of Maryland called Beltsville, Maryland, where it was um, a lot of different races. There was white people, Hispanic, Asian, I mean, all cultures. And I felt like I went through a culture shock because I'm like, I'm sitting in class with all these people who look different. Like one of the first people who said hello to me when I moved to this area, she was Filipino. And I just felt like, I felt like for three days, I was just sitting in class, like so confused because it was just a melting pot of so many different, um, you know, people and backgrounds. And I think that definitely, I, I really feel like if I would have stayed where I grew up the first 10 years of my life in Suitland, I would have been Kind of, I think I would have been different, especially when I compare like the people that I still see on social media that I grew up with the first half of my life compared to my second half of my life. It's, it's definitely a big difference. I'm sure it would have been different, but you mean, I'm assuming you mean uh, less exposure to opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely, definitely. And this, it makes me a little bit sad. Well, that's Dude, what I see that. That's why you do the work that you do. Yeah, yeah, that is one of the big reasons. Um, why why do they have less opportunities there? Like, what's what's the deal? Explain it to someone who doesn't know. Mm -hmm. So, in that area, um, it's, I want to say poverty. Like, it's. I wouldn't say poverty, but it's definitely, 
I think lower than middle class and I feel like it's the mentality of just you know work to survive mentality like you need to get a job as soon as you graduate high school and help pay bills type mentality not you know necessarily I want you to go to college and you know it's just you know we're working to survive kind of mentality and um I think that uh, you know a lot of people's parents kind of you know put that in their head that oh when you get 18 you get a job and this and that and not as more as you know higher not as much as higher education and um I just think that in Suitland not as many people were willing to mentor and kind of expose different things to us so what was your outlook like what did you what was your <clears throat> was it like a feeling of community and everything was good was it a feeling of fear like what was what was your feeling like was it like oh i love this like what what was going on for you zero to ten there um I kind of felt like I was trying to survive as well because I experienced a lot of bullying and in school and so I'm trying to fit in but also trying to defend myself and you know just growing up um I mean I thought it was normal at the time that's all I really knew um but I did also kind of feel like you know I'm just trying to make it through and not get teased and think of the latest comeback when they try to say something because I'm pretty tall so you know I'll always get made fun of for my height and then I, I was a little chubby so it was just a lot of different ways I was uh, getting bullied and I, I felt like I was trying to combat that and that was my main focus. And then when you shifted out of there it was less bullying? Yes it was very different people were very welcoming and hi you know what's your name and everyone was so friendly and that's why I was like what is going on why is everyone so nice what is happening like this is not what I'm used to but um you know eventually I just became accustomed to it we I went to middle school with those people and high school with a lot of them so it was definitely a different outlook um completely once I moved. Would, would you say that the bullying gave you like, now, now as an adult, would, looking back, would you say that that bullying time, did it give you insecurity or it made you tougher? Oh, it gave me a lot of insecurity. A lot of insecurity, unfortunately. Uh, I feel like I didn't really start loving myself till I turned 25. It's like literally when I turned 25, it was like a light off. I was like, wow, I think I like myself. I think I'm confident. I think, you know, I don't know what the shift was, but it definitely caused a lot of insecurity in me for a very, very, very long time. And it specifically, it was from that zero to 10 in that place. Yeah. Like, you know, just being called all these names for, you know, so many years in a row. And even when I was in kindergarten, like I remember I was in before and after care for one year and I felt it was the worst year of my life in kindergarten because people were so mean. I'm like, I'm in kindergarten. Like, why are these fourth graders so mean to me? It was to the point I had to like basically befriend like the teachers and they really didn't like that because it's like, oh, you're a teacher's pet. You're gonna tell the teacher. So it was just not a good time, but it, yeah, it definitely caused a lot of insecurity. Did you talk to your, your parents, your family, your grandmother about that? <laughs> I did. I did. And my grandma, actually, she was like, she said some not so nice things about some of the kids, like, oh, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I would go back and be like, well, my grandma said da, 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 da. And that got her in trouble <laughs> one time. That got her in trouble. So but grandma after knew that, these kids and she's like, oh, that's so-and-so's daughter and she's this and she's that. Yeah. <laughs> Like yeah because my grandma would yeah she would pick me up from aftercare and uh drop me off so she knew like some of the kids I was talking about and she was not cool. happy she did yeah she did not like it and so once I you know repeated what she said and then we had to get parents involved and all that stuff you know I I was a little less uh I didn't tell her as much because I didn't want it to be a big old thing anyone to get in trouble and so I kind of you know started keeping it to myself I'm, I'm very, I'm fascinated by, you know, we're going through a time where bullying is, is no longer tolerated. 
Mm -hmm. right? And I'm sure in a place like that today, there's still bullying. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But as you get uh, more like those places you went to after you were 10, there's less mm -hmm. bullying in these integrated spaces. Like mm -hmm. for you to say, oh, you're extra black, you know, in an integrated setting, it would be like, oh, we need to have a meeting mm -hmm. with him right away. Oh my gosh, you can't be saying, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But when you're in an urban poor setting and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, forget you, you know, you're really dark skinned and that would really like, you know, people would let it slide more mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you would, you know, feel bad and it would kind of, and, and I think that still happens today in those kinds mm -hmm. of spaces, but yeah. in those multicultural integrated spaces, you can't look at an eight, even at six or eight, eight years old, you can't look at an Asian person and say, oh, this, or, you mm -hmm. know, so it's interesting because there's a shifting, you know, mm -hmm. It, it was a def, it was a different time and I, and and I talked to my kids about it it was a different time where you would go outside for four five six hours at a time yeah mm -hmm. and you were like on your own with other kids yes yeah literally that's how I grew up I would be like see ya at like four o'clock and then like seven o'clock it's like okay I'll be making my way home and but now, yeah, I would never feel comfortable with my son not knowing where he is, what's going on. I don't know. But yeah, you, it is definitely you different. Hung out with the kids who were bullying you. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like, oh yeah, you know, Sandra, she she has a mouth and I gotta watch out for her. But you still hung out with Sandra. And mm -hmm. Sandra was friends with the other one. And sometimes they gang up on you, but you still went outside every day. Your parents yeah. don't say, go on outside. And you would be, mm -hmm. go outside and here comes Sandra again. And yeah. This was like a thing you had to deal with. And it was like, mm -hmm. all right, when Sandra's there, I try to go the other way. And it's just mm -hmm. like, like that kind of stuff now be, you know, now you go to Sandra's parents and, mm -hmm. you know, stay up. Yeah, it's completely different, yeah. And and I, and I tell my kids, the, the people, the kids, the Sandras of the world who's doing that, um, they're going through something at home. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they're picking on people and, and doing these things is because they feel that hurt inside Someone's mm -hmm. doing it to them and they're just projecting it back out to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So therapeutically, this stuff's still happening, right? On all mm -hmm. levels, even as mm -hmm. adults. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's where you come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> to be ready. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm sure that I will have a lot of cases, especially as a family therapist, where, you know, there will be situations where someone's kid may be bullied or, you know, insecure and the parents are trying to understand, you know, well, what do I do? How do I help build their self-esteem? How do I handle, you know, another kid? So um, that's definitely uh, still happening a lot in the community, not to as much of an extent, like you said, I do agree that now it's not as tolerable, but um, in the urban communities, I feel like people don't see it as much as an insult. If another black person says a certain insult to another black person, it's like, eh, okay. But if someone of another race says it, it's like, oh, we need to stop it immediately, but it's not okay in any sense, it's not okay. Um, so for me, one of the things, in terms of the podcast, what I'm really trying to do is um, a have a platform to just have insightful conversations, and for us to really talk about where we need to go moving forward. And mm -hmm. everyone, everyone's voice matters, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's not something for the experts. It's not something for the PhDs or whatever. Everyone has a voice in in what matter in in where we need to go. Where do you think? What do you think some of the things we need to work on give our priority attention to? So I really think we should prioritize self-healing because if you don't try to get help yourself, you cannot help anyone else. You can't help your kids. You can't help your spouse. You can't help your community. If you still have a certain mentality, certain biases, certain trauma, 
certain issues going on, you cannot be whole for someone else. So you really have to start with it and, you know, practice introspection and practice, you know, what is, you know, what am I doing wrong? It's so easy to point the finger at other people, but really think what could I do to be better? And then from there, you can, you know, teach your kids and show by example, you know, not just tell them be this way, but then they're looking at you every day and you're a completely different person. You know, you can be that example for people in your house and people in your community. Um, once you start within yourself, I think that's the biggest thing. <clears throat> um, we have the urban butterfly. Oh, yes, that's my best friend. <laughs> She's awesome. She's giving you a shout out. Oh, thank you. Hey, girl. <laughs> you know what? I continue, I continue to do this work and, I, and I'm really trying to build a coalition mm -hmm. and, and have people on the same page and also build each other up and strategize action steps. And mm -hmm. what you're saying is about doing that self-work. Yeah. Um, introspection to me, I, introspection is like the holy grail of healing. Yes. Um, yes. Most people are too busy or mm -hmm. make themselves, you know, too busy for real introspection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as a, as, a, as a person who wants to see healing in others, I, I find myself saying, hey, you need to go and do some work on that. Mm -hmm. and, that and that doesn't help. That doesn't work, right? Like, what should a per how do how do you go about that you know when you're in a situation of some you know this person needs to do the work and like well, how, do, how do you how can you help that that's really hard um it so after you know you feel like you have worked on yourself i feel like you know you just leading by example is is already a great start because I feel like sometimes we think that people don't notice it but a lot of times people around us notice that we have changed and, and can see the growth in us and they may not say it out loud but they notice it and they kind of in the back of their minds are wondering well how did you know he used to be a hothead he used to be this and that how is he you know so calm now and so this and that and they may not ask you because they may be embarrassed or ashamed or whatever but I think people notice and they want that healing for themselves they just don't know where to start so if you have a good relationship with someone like if you don't have a good relationship with someone or you barely know them it is you know really hard to try to you know uh, help them start that process but if you have a good relationship with someone if it's a friend or a family member that you feel like you have a good relationship with I think that you know just suggesting like, hey, you know, um, you know, asking them, have they ever thought about therapy or asking them, you know, to, you know, oh, have you ever thought of taking, you know, 10 minutes out of your day to practice, you know, uh, journaling or have you ever thought about, you know, just kind of sparking the conversation, not in a way that's like, you need to this and that pointing the finger where they can feel, you know, like, they, they need to be defensive, but just gently, you know, mentioning something that could help them um, and sharing your own story. Like, you know, I used to be like that, or, you know, I used to have those same issues and I was able to take these steps to conquer those goals. I think that's a good way to start and, and, you know, try to help another person heal within themselves. But, you know, unfortunately we can't heal everybody as much as we would want to. It's just some people who is just, you know, they've built up this wall that is just like so hard to break down. But I think just leading by example and just being kind and gentle can definitely help. Sean, I tell you something that's been hard for me. It's mm -hmm. those people who are closest to you, your spouse, mm -hmm. your parents, your relatives, your kids, and you want everything for them. You want it mm -hmm. now. You're like this, this, and this, and you're, you, you bring it to them every day. You bring it when you can, and you're, you're modeling it. And it's, that's really, really, really tough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to take this time to see if you had anything in your notes or anything like you really wanted to bring up and leave with that. 
I I touched on basically everything in my notes except for uh, about intimate partner violence something that I learned in class, which most people know as domestic violence. Um, and I did a mental health Monday on this, that it takes an average of seven times for someone to leave their partner who is, uh, you know, uh, violent towards them. And, and also that um, intimate partner violence, it doesn't just include physical violence. A lot of people think they're not being abused if they're not getting beat up or punched or, you know, physically hurt, but there's so many different other ways you can be abused financially, emotionally, psychologically, you know, there's just so many different ways. And I just, you know, urge people to uh, take the time to look up the different forms of uh, intimate partner violence and um, just look for any red flags in relationships or those around you. Um, just, you know, always think outside of the box of, oh, just physical violence. But if something doesn't feel right, if, you know, at the end of the day in your relationship, you don't feel good, you're crying more than you're happy, you know, just take time to research um, these different forms of abuse because you could be in the situation and not even know. So at that point, if you think you need help, you should seek the help of a therapist. Yeah, depending on the situation, in certain situations like therapists, like say if, uh, if it's physical abuse going on in a relationship, we would have to you know, report that and then it would be a, a special type of therapist that you would see for that because you know we wouldn't, it wait, could almost- Wait, if, if you go to a therapist and you tell them that your spouse is abusive, you have to report that? It, well, it depends on how far the abuse is. If it's to the point that I would feel your life is in danger, then I would have to report that. Right. If, it's, if it's not to that point, I wouldn't have to report that. But I know uh, that we were taught like, if it's couples therapy, at least, if it's couples therapy and both of you come in and he's being physically abusive, I cannot be your therapist in this because it could almost turn into a situation where the person being abused can look like it's their fault and almost a situation of manipulation can occur. So there is like a special specialty with that when working with that. Um, but if you feel like you're being abused in any way, I would definitely encourage you to seek help and, you know, to get a second opinion of someone who can tell you like, oh, this is definitely abuse and, and help you get out of that situation. I know people who are being abused in relationships, but um, I, I think they're, you know, they feel trapped and I don't think they necessarily want to leave the relationship. They just want to fix it. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think that's a lot of people. And unfortunately, you can't fix somebody else. You can only fix yourself. And, you know, if you want to be the, the best person and the most whole person you can be, you can't reach that if you're in a relationship where you're being abused or if you're with someone who's not trying to heal, it's just not going to work out, unfortunately. It's a hard truth. Mm -hmm. It's a hard truth. Now, I really thank you for your time today. Um, it's been a great talk. And um, I definitely want to continue to um, keep the dialogue open. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. I'd love to get you involved in other things going forward. Yeah. And it's been great talking with you today. Yes, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Like I said, this is my first podcast. I was so nervous, but you just made it so easy and just a great person to talk to. And I love what you're doing as well with uh, your podcast. It's great. Can you leave us with a, a, a positive tip? <sighs> a positive tip. Let's see. Um, so my positive tip, which I just love to preach, is just be kind to yourself, be patient and gracious to yourself, give yourself the second chances that you give everyone else, and just love yourself to the, you know, just love yourself, because once you do that, you can be a better person for everyone else in your life. Perfect, perfect. Keyshawn, thank you so much for coming on today. I'm really glad that you gave me the time and you came in today. Yes, thank you. All right. All right.